Withers is certainly among the more interesting NPCs in Baldur's Gate 3, and Larian has ensured that he would be essential. Uniquely, he is probably the only NPC you cannot kill or get rid of permanently in the game, and he has an intimate relationship, one could say, with some of the main antagonists. But most striking about Withers is none of that, but rather Larian's representation of the figure in Baldur's Gate 3. This representation is actually pretty novel, and without necessarily being critical of it, very different from every conception and interpretation of Withers before the release of the game. Now, if you've made it this far, you should know that there will be spoilers in this video, so proceed at your own risk. Withers is rather obviously the demigod Jurgle, and I will be referring to him off and on as such throughout the rest of the video. I have in fact talked about Jurgle before on this channel in a separate dedicated lore video, so do check that out if that's of interest to you. That video will be linked in the description, but it would behoove us all to go over the backstory of Jurgle once again, especially if you're not familiar with it, to understand how and why Jurgle is presented so differently in Baldur's Gate 3. Jurgle was once a very big deal in the ranks of divinity in Faerun, and lorded over several domains. He's also one of the most ancient deities in Faerun, predating virtually all others save for Shar and Saluna, and was unimaginably old even during the various ages of Netheril. He was, however, back then, very different from his later incarnations in several key ways, having taken on a more toned-down neutral and apathetic attitude towards the world in the present, as he was formerly unmistakably evil and tyrannical at the apex of his influence. During the time of Netheril, at the heights of the Empire's control and power over the world, there were much fewer gods in Faerun, and several of the gods as we know them today existed in somewhat different forms and roles, and reigned over multiple portfolios that were distributed to many different gods in later times. Thus Jurgle, being one such god, was the god of the dead, death, and tyranny as well as many smaller things associated with such affairs, such as undeath, wasting, and dusk. Shar, of course, was also present, as she, along with Saluna, are the oldest deities of the Pantheon, and she ruled over more than just darkness and loss, having mastery over hatred, thievery, illusions, and many other things. Jurgle was, to put a rather fine point on it, not a nice god, and this excerpt describing him as he existed thousands of years ago, time of Netheril, drives this point home. Jurgle, lord of the end of everything, was the power who presided over death, the dead, and undeath. He was responsible for keeping records on the final resting place of all the dead, and strove for order in death, anticipating the ever-encroaching termination of all things living. As the judge of the damned and the grim reaper, it was said that only Jurgle knew the final disposition of every spirit and the day of every being's final death and he was never wrong. The ultimate tyrant, no one unintentionally escaped Jurgle's grasp once they fell under the aegis of his portfolio. He was very jealous of his position, and even those of other faiths who sought to resurrect companions had to placate him or risk his retribution. Jurgle never visibly angered, and always spoke with a disembodied, chilling voice that echoed with a dry whisper of a long-forgotten crypt. His tone was deceptively bland, and his demeanor excessively formal. Even if his words portended horrors unimaginable, totally focused on death, he perceived life as momentary existence before death's eternity. The Lord of the Dead was depicted as a wizened, insubstantial mummy of some ancient alien race. His skin was gray and tightly strung across his frame. His bulbous, yellow, lifeless eyes and insectoid mandibles resembled a cross between a humanoid and a praying mantis. His ears and nose were barely distinguishable from his elongated skull. Most of his body was covered with an utterly lightless cloak that seemed to absorb the very atmosphere that enveloped it. He wore white gloves, which covered elongated claw-like hands and forearms, and a shadow-filled gray cloak that rose and fell as if buffeted by an unseen wind. He clutched a thick scroll covered with intricate, incomprehensible script and a freshly inked quill in his hands. Jurgle was said to be a shadowy, sinister figure who left a vague feeling of unease and enervation in his wake. He had total command over the undead, animating, creating, summoning, dismissing, and dispelling them at will. It was said that with his gaze, Jurgle could learn the sum total of a being's life, joys, fears, acts, and ultimate demise. And simply by inscribing a mortal's name on his voluminous scroll, he could inflict a being's fated demise immediately. His touch instilled fear, drained a being's life force, or could banish his victim to the realm of the dead. Now, as many of you probably know, Jurgle is no longer this god. 
The story might well be familiar to you by now, I would imagine, but at some point in time, Jurgle grew bored with his position as the Tyrant of Death and willingly ceded most of his power to three mortals sometime after the fall of Netheril, nearly 2,000 years ago. Bane took the portfolio of tyranny, Merkel that of the dead, and Baal that of death, i.e. murder. But with this transfer of power, it was not the end of Jurgle. Though one might say that it was a form of semi-retirement for the god, as he soon became the seneschal of the then newly appointed Lord of the Dead, Merkel, carrying out a new set of duties by keeping records of the dead and attending to the administrative affairs of the realm of the dead as well. Somehow, and over time, Jurgle's formerly deeply evil ethos became a much more neutral one. Though he remained steadfastly lawful and he became more and more the dispassionate and detached Scrivener of Doom we are all familiar with now. Jurgle has been in this position since handing over the reins of power to the Dead Three, at one time serving Merkel, then briefly Cyric, and now Kelimvor, the latter being most on his wavelength in terms of his approach to governing the Dead and Ethos. But something, one could say, has upset the balance recently, and that is nothing less than the appearance of a game called Baldur's Gate Three. Games and films have a way of changing characters and books, and by that, I do not simply mean changing their behavior. For the first time, characters from pages wrought of paper enter into your site fully fleshed out, indeed made of flesh in the case of cinema, or in the case of games, digital bits. But this physical representation itself is always going to be a matter of interpretation, as in many cases, we are seeing a character brought to life for the first time. Concerning Withers, this was no different and Larian decided to present Withers in a somewhat different manner than he had been portrayed in the literature. Compare this description with Jurgle in the game. Jurgle was frequently depicted as a member of an ancient alien race that resembled a cross between a humanoid and a praying mantis. He was a wizened and insubstantial creature, mummy-like in appearance, with gray, tightly taut skin. His elongated skull hosted bulbous yellow eyes devoid of life, and insectoid mandibles, as well as a nose and ears barely distinguishable from the rest of his head. Now to be fair, there is some overlap between Wither's appearance and his description, inasmuch as he has grey, tightly taut skin. But on the other hand, there is very little to nothing of the insectoid appearance mentioned, as his eyes are neither bulbous nor yellow, nor does he possess insectoid mandibles, though he does appear as one might argue as a mummy. Now. I do not mention this as criticism, but merely to point out that how characters from a literary source are described to us can oftentimes leave a lasting impression on the reader, and the transition from page to screen can have similarly lasting consequences. Indeed, in the context of D&D, it strikes me as entirely plausible that Wither's new appearance in BG3 will become his canonical physical representation going forward in all Forgotten Realms products. But the real question is, why did Larian deviate from the original description? Here we are left to speculate, but my sense is that the original physical description of Jurgel presented to us in the literature and source books would have been far too alienating, no pun intended, precisely because of his alien appearance, as I doubt an undead man insect would have come across as endearing to players, or even relatable. And thus, I think it likely that Larian changed Jurgel to make him both much more approachable and less scary to players as he was going to play such an integral role in the plot and story of BG3. Better to simply make him less frightening, lest we scare off those strange humans from the realm of real life, so to speak. That said, it is entirely possible to argue that Jurgle has intentionally taken on a more humanoid form to accommodate his role as Camp Guardian. After all, gods and Faerun cannot actually manifest themselves on the material plane and must use avatars, and thus Jurgle's avatar might intentionally look like this for the reasons mentioned prior. This view, however, does not work particularly well for the changes made to his personality. I'm going to argue that his physical change is part of an entire makeover that Jurgle has received in order to make him more approachable as a character in general in his central role as a guide and supplier of mercenaries and respects. Wither's Baldur's Gate 3 depiction is thus extremely different to that of his literary sources, for the simple reason that such a personality and character would have been untenable in his role as a very important NPC and above all, essential and helpful NPC. To be sure, Jurgle retains the general thrust of his historical depiction. He is dry, dispassionate, and does most certainly look undead, but there have also been many changes. 
Perhaps the most important question is why he's been sent to help you. It's not obvious at all, as in his historical depiction, Jurgle would have never interacted with mortals as he does in BG-3, let alone offer them direct help. Indeed, as the party itself points out in his tomb, very, very few worship the scribe of the dead, let alone know of him. Hence, his connection to mortals is, in every conceivable way, tenuous at best. Part of this is obviously plot device, but another part will probably become part of the canon and thus requires explanation. Now, if you ask him why he's helping you, he will tell you very plainly it is not by choice. Be assured. It is not by choice. Who then is making him help you? The seeming logical assumption is his master and superior, Kelimbor. But is this actually the case? We are never told directly in game why Jurgle is helping you. But we do know he's not there by choice. So what's going on? In all probability, we will never know which god or force sent Jurgle to help and interact with the party. But one can still speculate, as there's in fact data mine content that suggests that it was the god Helm that sent Jurgle to Faerun. Jurgle, a god of the dead, awaits the player in camp. He is bound by the judgment of another god, Helm, to assist the players as penance for past crimes. He provides resurrection services to the players. Based on this, the power compelling Jurgle to act would be Helm. But it seems odd that Helm would compel, or indeed could compel, somebody such as Withers. Again, this is clearly a plot device. However, there might be a plausible interpretation to think about that, given what we know about Jurgle in game and his own chastisement of the Dead Three in the epilogue. If Helm had sent Withers to Faerun, then it might be related to his poor choice of allowing them to become gods nigh two millennia ago. Since that time, they have caused all kinds of havoc and destruction, with the initiation of the Time of Troubles at the hands of Bane and Merkel being the worst. One needs to ask why this time seems so different. Is it the cumulative foul play of the Dead Three after so many centuries that justifies the intervention? It could very well be. There are dozens and dozens of horrific events in the history of Faerun that could be laid at the feet of the Dead Three. So perhaps it is the culmination of such things. But then again, there's one area of concern here that differentiates this matter from others, and that is the matter of the Mind Flayers and the question of souls. By Jurgle's account, Illithids do not have apostolic souls, though there is some debate on this, and I did make an entire video about this that I will link in the description. But assuming he is right, perhaps the stakes are so high, because this is not merely a matter of death and destruction, but one of the death and destruction of souls, which gods require to populate their divine realms. Even if Withers does not have a mandate from Helm, which may or may not be the case, Withers is certainly disappointed, to say the least, in the Dead Three, and likely himself for having chosen them as replacements. And that, in conjunction with the destruction of mortal souls, might be enough to explain his presence. Ultimately, we will never know exactly why, and it might not even make that much sense, as everything needs to fit the story of Baldur's Gate 3, regardless of its theological plausibility. And now we come to Jurgle's most decisive change, and the question of Jurgle's very nature as a divine entity. Originally, he was a very cruel, albeit orderly and lawful god. And when he stepped down from power, he became a much more apathetic and neutral one. And he was presented to us in the literature, up until now, in just this way. Withers, on the other hand, can appear surprisingly kind and understanding during the course of Baldur's Gate 3. Specifically, I am referring to the situation with the orphaned Arabella. The original Jurgle, to be blunt, would have been piteously indifferent to everyone's fate, even that of a child such as Arabella's. But again, Given the plot constraints of Baldur's Gate 3, that would not have fit the story very well. And thus, Jurgle is far more human than we normally would take him for, because it is necessary for the game to flow. Though to be fair, even in his humane treatment of a child, he remains nonetheless somewhat detached and withdrawn. This is perhaps most evident in the delightful fan service that Larian provided to players in the form of Withers hosting a get-together party at the end of the game. No, that probably would not happen outside of a game. In fact, I cannot recall anything like that in all of the history of the Forgotten Realms. When the original Baldur's Gate games came out, few at the time, myself included, thought that the plot of these games would have a lasting impact on the lore of the Forgotten Realms itself. And yet, it did. And eventually, it became canon. I raise this point because Jurgle is now likely changed forever, and going forward he probably will be perceived as vastly different than before, depending on where you're coming from. If you had read the lore and books involving him prior to his appearance in Baldur's Gate 3, then your image of an apathetic insectoid mummy 
has forever been shattered, and you will need to adjust. If, however, this is your first exposure to the demigod, then no such adjustment is necessary. Anytime a character from a book or literature reaches the screen, be it film or game, that character is always changed. Think of Tyrion Lannister from Game of Thrones. Having read the books of the 90s, my sense of him was very different from what we came to know and appreciate in the actor who played him, Peter Dinklage. For many who only watch the series, Peter Dinklage is Tyrion. And even for those who had read the books, Peter Dinklage became Tyrion, and Tyrion's depiction in the books is not but a distant memory. I suspect we can expect the same of Jurgel, or any other character or god that we happen to meet and interact with in a game going forward that was formerly a literary figure. The new Jurgel is much more human, understanding, concerned, and dare I say compassionate than the old one ever could have been. And whether rightly or wrongly, Baldur's Gate 3 made him this way, and it is this way he shall forever remain going forward. Pixels, one could argue, speak louder than a thousand words. Thank you to everyone for watching. If you like my content, you can leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe as it really helps out the channel. It'd be much appreciated, and I will check you out next time. Take care.